If you want to go ahead and, and, and get your Scriptures ready, I'm going to be reading from the book of Habakkuk and the book of Jeremiah. And I, I started this sermon from a perspective of destruction to America and not in the sense of, of, of you may think uh, with a title like that, but because it was really uh, the sermon was going to be more geared around not concerned about what's coming, but be concerned more about being ready. And in in this, I really began to see the the, the Lord uh, just just made some things very clear. To me, and I, and I will tell you that the the day and time we're living in, with with the condition of much of the church world, and when I say church, I'm talking about people. I'm not talking about a building. Many times, through our own demise of 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 being improper interpretation of the Word of God, it is it is led to us to having some false expectations from God. If you've ever been in any of my pre-marriage or marriage counseling, I, I speak about, in particular, four stages of death. And that, that analogy can be used in any aspect of our life because it deals with, unre first one deals with unrealistic expectations. And many times as Christians, we are expecting something from God that He never promised that He would do. Now granted, God has done a lot, of us, a lot for us, but sometimes we believe that He's obligated to do some things and it leaves us in want. Today, honestly, I believe in every church represented, every community represented, there needs to be someone in that community, someone in that church that truly has a heart for the things of God and that, that has a heart and, 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 and enough reality to ask the hard questions of, Lord, we see this going on, we watch this, we read about how You moved in in times past, but we don't see that movement from you any longer. And we, we have to admit there's nothing wrong with God, so we must look inward. And I believe if, if we're willing to really remove the pretense, allow God to remove the scales from our eyes and help us to see and help us to hear, we'll be, we, first of all, we're not going to be happy with what we will see, but it will be the first step on getting on the right track that we as the body of Christ need to be. Now I will tell you, for many, many years, I've been a Christian for 30 years, and, and, and probably 20 of those years, I was steep deep into Bible prophecy. I love prophecy. If, if you want to teach prophecy, you get the more attendance from people. People are just interested in the last days. Many times, if it's not just to satisfy their own curiosity, they're interested. But I will tell you, all of my study in prophecy never once was, was the purpose to figure out a date that it would happen or even how it would happen, rather that it would happen. And I, and I thank God that he's, he's, he's protected me from that because even in the book of Matthew, one of the greatest warnings that Jesus, is, that Jesus gave there some 2,000 years ago that I believe is still such a strong warning uh, uh, when, when you're dealing with end time prophecy and everybody today is talking about it. Almost everyone is talking about prophecy with everything going on in the world between the COVID and, and some things that I may just m make mention of, we, if we're not careful, we will fall into the trap of being uh, deceived. And 
I believe that the devil has laid some groundwork over the last 50, 75, or 100 years, little by little, bringing the church out of the truth of the Word of God and start following man-made doctrines. We see throughout the New Testament that Jesus and even the apostles warned about these things. And today you and I must come to the conclusion that if we've been in church attendance for any time at all in our life, there has probably been some form of deception, of indoctrination that has been introduced to us. That, and, it's, and it's not that people are evil, it's just the scheme of the devil is to get us away from truth. And I, I, I don't know if I can say thankfully or not, to be honest with you, because it's, it's brought me a lot of ridicule uh, uh, of being able to make a stand against so much tradition, again, a stand of, of things that are not, that are not uh, scripturally correct. And because of that, it has caused a little problem. But today, it's my, my, my goal here is not to talk about that, but my goal here today is to bring it to your awareness because the Lord is truly needing. You know, many times we say that God doesn't need us. He may not need me, but He needs people. You might say, well, God doesn't need people. Yes, He does. Because why? He chose people to do His work. So He's, he's going to have some people that is going to carry this work forward. He doesn't need people for His survival, but to carry the message, that's, that is the, 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 the avenue that the Lord has chosen. And He's really reaching out to the body of Christ to wake up from our slumber, to begin to look at the Word of God under a new, under a new eye. Because I'm going to tell you, there are people in this world, Christian and non-Christian and I alike, that need the help of the church, need the help of you and I. Whether this is prayer, and, I'm, and that's not a, 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 a something that, that I'm saying anybody can do, anybody can do it, but no, it's, it's a desperate need. Whether you're talking about your, your, your professional people in, in, in the law enforcement, the medical field, our school teachers, Whatever the case may be, our government leaders, we need, and they need wisdom, they need protection today like they've never needed in their entire life. And the body of Christ must be able to stand up and fill that void, first and foremost, and then we'll see what else the Lord would have us to do because we have a purpose and, a, and God has a plan for you and I to be here. I'm quite confident, and maybe it's because I'm, I'm reading. It, it's gotten out of hand. My Dorothy happened to look at, at my tablet the other day. And over the last probably couple, three or four months, I am 48,000 emails behind on catching up. I, I'm, I, I get alerts about every two minutes. I'm reading and I'm trying to at least scan and to see what's going on in the world. And then I'm trying to look into the church world and seeing what the church is, is doing about this. And I've come to the conclusion that the church, the people, we have been rocked to sleep. And this has happened because we did not heed the warning from Christ in Matthew 24. Be careful that you be not deceived. And we've allowed the pulpit, and we've allowed the government, and we've allowed everything, we've, and ultimately we've allowed the devil to come in and control the narrative in the church of God. And the Lord is calling us to come out from among this. Be separate. And we must do this. Little by little, we must start moving back to where we can hear. Back to where God can speak. Back to where we are following a true doctrine. Back to where when we read it in the Bible, we believe it and it's not open for a hundred or two hundred or a thousand different interpretations with the, with, the, with the understanding that everyone could possibly be right. 
We must come out from under this type of ideology and this type of thinking. We must start being able to, to be able to pull ourselves aside and, and spend some time with God and to be able to get into His Word regularly and to be able to have communion with Him regularly so that we can build up that relationship so then we will understand when we are hearing from God. Many times I've heard this, and I, I only bring this to, to just show you where we've went as a church. And, and today you may walk out of here and not agree with me, but if I promise you if you will just not push it aside, but give it some consideration and give it some prayer, you're going to find out the very words that I'm speaking is true when it comes to the church. We gauge the, a church, whether it's good or bad, by the types of messages it preaches. We gauge if a church is good or bad by how often we have communion, by how often we have or not have altar calls, or by how many people is in the altar. We gauge a church if it's good or bad by if... By, 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 uh, is, is a sermon being preached? Is it a plan of salvation? Is a sermon being preached? Is it about repentance? We we gauge a church based upon a service or a message that was preached. And even though these can be some good questions that we could ask and maybe some good observations to make because we definitely don't want to get way out into left field. But the marks of a true and a strong church is not gauged only on that. But more importantly, the marks of a true and a strong church is what are we doing with the message that we are hearing. If you were at the park last week and we had a wonderful time, we had a great time. And by the way, I, I, they, George wanted me to play some horseshoes and some people decided they wanted to take us on. So I'll just tell you, if you ever want to play horseshoes, you want to be on the winning side, you need to choose me. You thought I was going to say not, didn't you? No, we absolutely wore them out. One time, we played to 21. One to, what was it, Greg? Not in 21 to 2? Yeah, I, I, didn't get, I, I didn't think you'd remember that one. But, but we, had, we, had a, we had a wonderful time. And, and the entire time, and I talked to different people. And yeah, we would talk about everything, but... We, one thing every group I talked to had in common, someone was saying something about God. And it took me back to the book of Malachi. And the Bible says that the Lord looked down and He seen His people. The Bible doesn't say that they were praying. It didn't say that they were having church. They were just about doing business of that day. And the Bible says the Lord heard them. And he wrote down in a book of remembrance what was being said. Folks, this goes beyond. We, when, we, when we assemble here, the purpose for assembling here, oh boy, and please don't shut me down, the purpose of coming to church is not so that you can be encouraged. If you need to come to church to be encouraged, there's something wrong with your walk with God. I'm not saying church, you shouldn't be in church. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. The, the writer gives us a warning because he says in the last days, this is what's going to be happening. So COVID didn't catch us off guard or anything else that's coming because whatever happens, they're going to turn against the church because the warning comes is forsake not the assembling of yourself together as the manner of some are doing in these last days. So yes, when we come to church, and, and the reason I say that if we're coming because we need to be encouraged, you need to take another look into your life. Not that there can't be an encouraging word. Not that the, the message should not encourage you. But I will tell you, the 
purpose of the church to come together as praise and worship and to inform and to educate every one of us so that when we go out into the battlefields, we go out with the battle plan and we go out equipped to fight whatever we're going to meet up with as soon as we walk out these doors. The church, we do not come together for the purpose of ourself making our life better. But we come together for the purpose, maybe even to learn how to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of others. And the church has got this wrong. The church has went backwards on this. We're, we've, got, we've went upside down. So the question should be, is what am I doing or am I going forth with the message? Last week I asked the question of, of, of if, if you could look back on Saturday, what did your life look like? If Friday, what did it look like? Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, what did your life look at? Was there any evidence being laid in your path that would have, that would have said uh, uh, that, that I'm part of the body of Christ, that I am part of taking the message of the cross, that I am part of, of, of loving people and, and, and wanting to help people. But today, many of us, we, we, we realize that as we start seeing the truth in God's Word, we, we, we begin to wonder, what, what should we be doing? What can we do? And don't get me wrong. I, I believe being prepared physically is very important, but it's much lesser than being prepared spiritually. And I, I will tell you the only reason that I took up and, and had others to, to begin to teach some of this physical preparedness in this church is so that if infrastructure goes down, whatever begins to happen, we're not relying upon government to take care of us, but that we will be ready to go forth to continue with the message no matter what situation we find ourselves in. But that's the lesser duty of the Christian. It's time that the Christians in America, it's time that the Christians all over the world start following the truth of God's Word instead of good ideals from man. Maybe we need to lock ourselves up in a room in our house or somewhere. Maybe we need to even get so serious that I'm not even going to go back to work until the Lord begins to show me what I must be doing, what my part and my plan and the purpose for me in this entire situation. You know... I'm going to talk to you just for a few moments about what's going on in the world. And, and I would probably dare say there's probably not a greater researcher in this church than I put forth into this. I, there's something about I don't want to be caught off guard. And, and, and I, I, I want to make sure that, that, that I can help this body of believers as much as possible. For several years, many years, you can go back even further, but really in 1979 you begin to hear a little bit of talk about a planet. Now, this is not the purpose. I'm just, I'm just going to share where people are getting really nervous. And now the Christian people are starting to get nervous. If you want to research it, you can research Planet X. Planet Nibiru, I believe is the way you pronounce it. I've been following this for about four or five years now. And I only address it now because the Christian community is picking it up and they're getting really, really scared and a lot of people are getting kind of stupid about this. So it's not, it, it, it's, it's, it's not a question, is there this Planet X out there? There is, and apparently this collided with Jupiter or something many, many years ago, and now a lot of this debris field is coming into our atmosphere, or is coming in to, to our space. And I believe it was last week, we, we seen a very close call 
But a lot of this debris that's coming, and, and trust me, if you, if, you, if you Google this now, it, it will scare you to death. A lot of this coming, they're saying, as, as early as tomorrow, we could start seeing debris that's going to get through our, our Earth's atmosphere. And some say this is going to be a little bit later in November. Some say in early part of next year. And the, the dates are all over the board. But it's caused a, a great concern that something terrible is about to happen in this world. And then you couple that with, I'm hearing, I'm so tired about hearing about the election in November. If Trump doesn't get elected, then, then our country's doomed. Or if he gets elected, we're going to be okay. Folks, I'm telling you, I am a supporter of Donald Trump, and I'll say that from this pulpit. I, I, I don't hide that fact. But Donald Trump is not our Savior, and I'm really tired of hearing Christians putting so much faith in Donald Trump. It's being talked about, talked about, talked about whenever the, the Christian world should be talking about our faith in Jesus Christ and talk about the church needs to come to a point of repentance. But, but all these things, and, and people are talking about the destruction that's coming, and, and, and we can read in the book of Revelation, we can read in the book of Daniel and, and some of these other prophetic books, and we see some of these things because the book of Revelation, we can see where there could be things from the, from the sky, some, some meteorites and, and different things, and, and now we're seeing a lot of CMEs coming off the sun that's, that could disrupt uh, and cause earthquakes and, and, and volcanoes and, and, and and tsunamis and tornadoes and all these things. We're, we're hearing all of these things and, and people are getting really scared and they're wondering, when's it going to happen and what can I do to be ready? And I'm telling you, the day to be ready is right now. It's so sad that the church isn't ready. See, the church ought to be leading this charge. The church ought to be giving, giving help and, and instruction, even what's going on with the COVID. The church should remind everyone, yes, we need a great leader, but our hope is not in this one man. The health of our nation is in the hands of God. And I will tell you, the health of our nation is not only in the hands of God, but whether His children, the church, will be obedient or disobedient. And I believe that we're going to see a distinctive line drawn in the sand in the church of those that are obedient and those that are disobedient. Those that have come out from among the world and those that are still going to play. Those that are calling sin out and are going to do their best to stay away from sin and those that still want to play footsies with sin. Those that that are going to continue doing things the way we've done it for the last hundred years, and, and those that are saying it's not working, we have missed the mark somewhere, and seek God for some understanding and some help. I picked out a couple of passages in this to, to, to drive my points home today. The first one in Habakkuk, the verse in Habakkuk chapter 3. If you've not there yet, don't try to find it. It's a hard book to find in the Old Testament. It's only three chapters. It's one of the, the minor prophets. But I'm only going to read two verses because it's very, it's very important to understand because in these two verses, or three verses, there's a very important message for, for, for you and I on what I believe the Lord is showing me that's getting ready to take place in our life. Now listen, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. Now, you, you realize this is talking about a, a, a bad time. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Verse 18, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Verse 19. For the Lord God is my strength. 
What the prophet is saying here, that no matter what happens, I'm going to exalt, I'm going to praise, and I'm going to worship. And I'm going to tell you, you will not manufacture that spirit not for long. If troublesome times hit, and they have, and they're going to continue, if you are not grounded and rooted in who God is, and I'm not talking about some type of ideology out here, but I'm talking about a truth of who God is, you will fall into the traps of what many people have fallen into. But the prophet is here is saying that no matter, no matter what comes my way, I'm going to exalt and praise and I'm going to worship. I was listening to a gentleman preach this past week and, and what was so great, he described in words uh, what I was thinking. I just couldn't find the words. And, and I find this, I'm going to take a look here in a moment at the book of Jeremiah chapter 34 if you want to be ready when I get ready to go there. But I, in, in, this, in this passage, let me just give you an overview of it. And to get a, a, a good understanding, you read to need more than just this, this passage. There's, there's other scriptures that, in Isaiah that helps us to even understand what's going on with Jeremiah at this point. You have a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. You have the last king of Israel, which is called Zedekiah. And right outside the gate, you have the Babylonians getting ready to intrude. And Jeremiah receives a word from the Lord to go to give to King Zedekiah. And in this, the king or the Lord is telling the king, "You're going to be a prisoner. You're going. You're, this this is just. It's going to happen. You're going to be a prisoner of 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 Nebuchadnezzar." But in this passage, he gives some hope to. Uh, in my opinion, should be some hope and encouragement to Zedekiah. Um, but apparently it wasn't heeded. One of the things that this passage points out that the Lord addressed was after, after all that God had done in taking the Hebrew children out of the Egyptian bondage, we get back to this point and he's saying, these slaves that you have, you need to turn them loose. And they momentarily agree to do that, but then they go back on their word. So you see, you see God has now, what we, we, we changed the whole dynamics of what is now going to happen. So let's, let's read in Jeremiah. Verse 1. It's going to be hard to follow because I'm, I skip around in this chapter. The word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah from the Lord when Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and all his army and all the kingdoms of the earth of his dominion and all the people fought against Jerusalem and against all the cities thereof saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Go and speak to Zedekiah king of Judah and tell him, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city to the land of the king of Babylon and he shall burn it with fire. And thou shalt not escape out of his hand, but you will surely be taken, delivered to his hand, and thine eyes shall behold the eyes of the king of Babylon, and he shall speak with thee mouth to mouth, and thou shalt go to Babylon. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah, thus saith the Lord of thee, thou shalt not die by the sword. This, then we go to verse 8. This is the word which came out of Jer unto Jeremiah from the Lord. After that, the king Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people which were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty unto them, that every man should let his manservant, every man his maidservant, being a Hebrew or an Hebrewess, go free, that none should serve himself of them, to wit, of a Jew his brother." Now when all the princes and all the people which had entered into the covenant heard that every one should let his manservant and one his maidservant go free, that none should serve themselves of them any more, they obeyed and let them go. Now when you go to verse 16, it's turned. 
But you turned and polluted my name and caused every man his servant and every man his handmaiden, whom you had set at liberty at their pleasure to return and brought them into subjection to be unto you for servants and for handmaids. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, ye have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty, every one to his brother, every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim a liberty for you. Now listen, saith the Lord to the sword, to the pestilence, and to the famine, I will make you to be removed from the kingdoms of the earth. Now here, he, he told them up here one thing. Now they've, they've completely rebelled against His Word. And I will give the men that have transgressed My covenant, which have not performed the words of the covenant, which they have made before Me. And when they cut the calf in twain, and pass between the parts thereof, the princes of Judah, the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land, which pass between the parts of the calf. I will even give them to the hand of their enemies, and to the hand of them that seek their life, and their dead bodies shall be for meat unto the fowls of heaven, and the beast of the earth. Now this is why I wanted to share this with you. No matter, excuse me, no matter what's coming. And I believe we're going to see a mighty move of God. But that mighty move of God is going to be of judgment. And it's going to also be of grace and mercy. The grace and mercy of those of us who choose to be obedient, but yet we're going to suffer. In my opinion, because of what's been going on, especially over the last several months, God has exposed evil in this nation like no other time in our history. Not only the things that, that have got people in an uproar, and, and by the way, this, this with Planet X, our, our, that's not even new to our government. They've been making preparations for this thing and the damage it might possibly do to the earth since 1979. This, this is all documents that you can read. But that's regardless. I believe that the ones that are obedient, it, it's going to be hard. And, I, and I've been thinking, Lord, how, how, what, what words can I even say that, that can explain what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling. And I was listening to this guy talk, and I'm so great he used the medical terminology because I really understand the, the medical terminology of this. And if I could use his words, it would be that God is getting ready to do surgery on this nation. with all the evil that's been exposed from sex trafficking to not only the abortion, but with everything else that's going on, the, the rioting in the streets, pure evil. Folks, let me tell you something. It takes a real low life to get in elderly, and I mean 70 and 80 year old people, elderly to get in their face and to flip them off. And to spit in an old woman's face. And to hate a nation where people have given their lives so that they could have the freedom to even get out and ride. God is allowing, He's exposed this evil for us to see. And we're going to be responsible to act or not to act. I'm not talking about taking up arms. I'm talking about, first and foremost, we must, we, we've got to get to a place with God and get our life in order. 
And then we've got to be able to offer a plan and a purpose and along with what we're sharing the message of the cross and the gospel and preaching Christ crucified. We must also be able to be able to speak into the lives of the people to help them not only spiritually but also physically and to help encourage them. And we will only be able to do that if we are encouraged, if we've not fallen into the trap. Well, I believe the Lord has exposed this. And if you and I, if the church, if we will come out of our slumber and come out of our sleep, I believe that we could see this systematic approach happen in our nation where the Lord will, as He's exposing this evil, and we start standing against all this evil, and this evil has to be eradicated. But here's the deal. If any of you have ever had surgery, especially much of a, 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 an extensive surgery of any kind, for example, if you've got a tumor in your body, and I don't care where it's at, if a surgeon goes in to remove that tumor, that day you wake up and the next days and weeks and maybe months afterwards, your body is going to be hurting, you're going to be feeling awful, you're going to be feeling terrible. But the, the purpose of that surgery was to remove the evil and to preserve life. I'm telling you, the purpose of this surgery is to remove the evil, but to preserve. But it's going to hurt us all. That's why we must be able to realize that God, just like the prophet Habakkuk said, we must praise God. And some of us may have to go to jail and some may even have to die for their faith. But regardless of what we have to do, we will not question God and His plan and purpose of, of what we must be doing. That's in total contrast with what the church and how the church thinks today. And I know it, I pray I don't lose you, and I pray you just don't get upset and, 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 and just, just shut me out. But the church in general, our thinking is, is God should give us everything that we ask regardless. We make statements, if I have enough faith... That destruction will not come to my house and destruction will not come. There, that I'm not going to have bad days and I'm not going to have bad days. If I have enough faith, I'll be healed of this cancer. If I have enough faith, my wife, my spouse, my kids, whatever, they'll come home. And yet, our loved ones die of cancer that love God and, and our, our spouse don't come home. Now, I will admit, the majority of the time, especially when it comes to healing, God always heals our body. The only time our body is not healed from, from a disease is when we die. But we put this, we, we've turned this Word of God into something that, that make, that's going to make my, the purpose of it is to make my life better. And even though it will, that cannot be our focus in trying to make our life better. So we're, we're making these type of statements and we're leaving people and ourselves in a place of confusion when it doesn't work out the way that we think that it should. So I'm telling you, what's coming is going to hurt. But I believe God has given us an opportunity like He did Zedekiah in the house of Zedekiah. If we will just listen and be obedient that God has already made a path for us, the path what I like to call of least resistance. And it may, we may call some people our jobs. It may do it. I, uh, there was a teacher in New York, and I believe New York City, just here a, a, a week or so ago, that leaked 850 files, a, a document of what Black Lives Matter and the curriculum that they're going to be pushing and are pushing into our schools, into many of our cities. And if, it, if it's not stopped, it will visit a school near you. Because of this, I believe God is raising up 
He's raising up an army that's going to stand, Lord, I'm going to stand with You and I'm going to stand with truth even if it means my life. If we can ever come out from under this deception, this spell from the world, from, from, from government, from the church, from, from, from the devil, whatever, and, and wake up and see. Yes, we are going to have to engage in spiritual warfare. But we must come to a place like the people we read about, and not only read about in the Bible, but out throughout history that stood. I'm, I'm going to attempt to tell a story, and I'm so afraid I'm going, I'm going to get stories crossed. But, but regardless, and I, don't, I don't remember if it was from the family that spoke during the, the, the convention this week, the Republican National Convention, or if it was somewhere else. But it talked about a girl, instead of staying at home where it was safe and needs met, she went into the mission field and she was captured by ISIS. And of course, her family was pleading with the previous administration to help get their daughter out. And they never got her out. For 18 months, she was tortured, she was raped, she was brutalized. She was on occasion able to get a letter out to her parents, people would sneak a letter out. And I have to paraphrase the letter, I don't remember, but it basically said that I have no regrets. None. I don't have any regrets. And I'm not discouraged, but I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged even to her death, even to whatever was going to lay in her future, she was encouraged. And she would not, she would not renounce her faith. She would not back up from who she was. And I bet even, I bet she wouldn't even renounce her citizenship of America. I don't know that. But just reading, just, just listening and reading this, I, I was quite moved and I began to think, this is, a, this is a girl that lives in today's world. This is the relationship that you and I must have with Christ. That no matter what. I was normally don't do this, and I'm going to close with this. About midnight last night, for whatever reason, I'd finished up a little bit early and and I was going to see what was playing on Netflix and the first movie that popped up was called The Young Messiah. And I normally don't talk about movies. I don't recommend a lot of movies. But I, I wanted to watch this and the reason I did because I know the Bible doesn't have much to say about His young life. So I knew that they were going to have to make this seem more personal and more real. In my opinion, I, I believe they did an outstanding job. But they pick up the life of Jesus about six years old. And they've never told Him who He was. And He has all these questions and Finally, a friend of his at the age of seven, his cousin tells him all the spectacular things that happened at his birth. And then by the time you get to the end of the show, Mary sits him down and, and tells him the entire event. And it was so moving to sit there and think how she was telling this young boy that that you are God. You, you came to redeem mankind. 
And what I was taken with, and I'm going to end at this. She said, you came and the responsibility of taking care of you and raising you was not given to the kings or the princesses or the rabbis. But it was given to a lonely carpenter and an unworthy mother. Folks, the Lord left us with the greatest responsibility. And He did not leave this in the hands of the government. He didn't leave this in the hands of the business leaders. He left this in the hands of the common citizen. That's you and I to be the church and stop, get out of this mentality of attending church and start being the church. It is of utmost importance we understand the difference between the two. He could have left this responsibility to anyone, but He left it to us. The question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to continue living the way that we've been living? Or are we going to find a better and a closer relationship with Christ because this fear mongering cannot be called cannot be among the body of Christ that has to be cast out of our life we've got to be able to to know that God has got our back and I'm not talking about being stupid but I'm talking about that we first and foremost we have a purpose and a plan and that takes priority over anything in our life that is how radical our walk has got to be. Let's bow our heads. Father, we love you. We